examples of uh, grain-based cuisines here for us all to enjoy, and those have been uh, paired also with uh, with uh, uh, wonderful uh, distilled and uh, brewed products, and, uh, and so it's just going to be a great time. We, and I, I'm in teacher training at Seattle Pacific University. I taught in public education for 25 years, and and uh, and so I'm all about experiential learning, and uh, this this will be fully experiential. Uh, <coughs> so uh, we're going to uh, involve uh, all what we consider all the modalities here, from uh, from taste to sight to shaking hands and getting to know folks. So I extend to you a warm welcome. Thanks, Don, uh, uh, for the fine work you do here. And, uh, and this is a special opportunity for me, too, in the sense that uh, those of you that have been taking part in Cascadia events for a while um, uh, have come, I hope, to uh, in enjoy and expect uh, certain kinds of themes and topics that uh, relate to our mutual interest. Uh, and at the same time, uh, you know, I just am really grateful for, for sort of an opportunity for a fresh look at these topics found myself going into material that I had not uh, uh, ever shown publicly and I'm uh, thrilled to have a chance uh, to do that. Um, I also have to say in preparing for our time together it gave me also an opportunity uh, to encounter some new discoveries, not just stuff that I knew had been there that I haven't shared with anybody yet, but uh, also some uh, some new encounters. So uh, I'm not expecting you to exactly be on the edge of your seats about these things, but my family knows that I am. And uh, I'm happy to introduce my brother Don here sitting up front who's worked with me to reestablish Palouse Colony Farm. And you might know that the Palouse is, of course, synonymous with uh, uh, outstanding uh, grain growing area. I saw Don Meyer here. I don't see Don right now, but I think he's here close by. And uh, and so uh, it may be on the other side of the state, but part of what you'll experience uh, this evening, uh, visually, I hope, and through the storyline, is how tightly uh, the inland northwest is linked to the Puget Sound area because of the grain story. The the two are hugely mutually reinforcing and have been since the 1800s in very fascinating ways. Uh, so with that, uh, <clears throat> I'll kind of commence on this little pre-10 minute and then we'll kind of march through these periods of time that you see indicated on your uh, handout. Then we'll dismiss out there each time and I'm not sure uh, with the group if we're going to ring a dinner bell or what after 10 minutes, but then, then we need, need to reassemble back in here and then we'll kind of acquaint you then with the next uh, phase. Now bring an old junior high teacher if there's not a bell, I can figure out another way to get you. <laughs> Well, hey, you know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start right off here in this first moment, uh, uh, brief session, by drawing your attention to the photograph here. You know, until just a few years ago, uh, we could have just spoken abstractly about the original grains in the Pacific Northwest. Uh, because, yes, we can read the accounts, and, and Don invoked the name of the good Dr. Tolmy and Dr. McLaughlin. Uh, you know, these were farm people. Uh, we don't often associate the fur trade era with farming. Uh, they were about something else, I thought, we thought. But when you delve into the records, in fact, you find from the genesis of trade in the Pacific Northwest, these people were interested in the grain business. Um, it took a while in a big detective story that I won't go into detail with you tonight uh, about how it was we came to identify what that original grain was. Um, uh, a 60 second bird walk is that in my role at uh, Seattle Pacific University we put on teacher training conferences throughout the region and I, and I don't like doing the same thing twice. When I taught, I taught a whole different realm every three years. I just wanted to experience something new. So I don't like going to the same place either all the time. And uh, so I, I went to Fort Nusqually just, just because I heard there was a big room that was cheap. Uh, so, okay, go to this place, invite all these teachers, and we're talking about how to experiential uh, with learning for uh, history and language arts and that. And uh, the, the host, who was the um, uh, director of the museum, 
uh, says, uh, oh, hey, you know, since you're talking about all these things, Richard, uh, you might be interested in checking our archives out, you know, afterwards. And, you know, we've got stuff here that might be interesting to you. So, so I, so, oh, well, fine, you know, I'm always up for a new adventure. Uh, so, so I'm looking through these fur trade journals that they're happy to provide for us. And, and I'm really thinking this is about pelts and traps. And instead, it's all this wheat stuff and barley stuff, and it's white grain, and it's yellow grain, and it's red grain. And uh, finally, I, I, asked, uh, I uh, asked him, Mike uh, McGuire, you'll see his picture in a second, I said, you know, I thought this was a fur trading post. And he said, oh yeah, we did that, but, uh, but oh yeah, look what else happened. So that opened the door to the old farm boy, Richard, wanting to find out what do you mean by red grain? What do you mean by white grain? There's a thousand soft white wheats. Uh, what really were they raising here? And thanks to our good friends, here's Abba. Where's Abba? I know, out busily working, I suppose, getting ready for us here, but you <coughs> met her when you came in. Uh, you know, the whole WSU team here uh, has uh, worked collaboratively with those good folks up at Mount Vernon. Uh, and you'll see a picture of them at the research center through uh, Steve Jones and Steve Lyon and their very supportive team. Uh, it took about 18 months, and we finally were able to track down exactly what that first variety is. And you're looking at it right there. It's white llamas, nicknamed Old White Winter. It's a soft white wheat that came from merry old England. And Don, um, I'll get to, uh, <coughs> okay, I'm organized, I guess now. I don't know how to hit the right button here. Um, uh, so, so, so to get you started with really where it starts, I think this is the only slide I'm showing tonight that you might have seen before. I got all new stuff out here for you in case you've been following these stories with me. But I love this picture, and actually it might be a different one. I have two different ones from two different painters. But this is Sir George Simpson. Guess what? He's got the nice hat, okay? He's the one coming out here, not looking like he really belongs here, but boy did he. This was a man who was elected governor of the Hudson's Bay Company in the early 1800s, and boy did he have a vision. He knew about global trade long before this became a popular term and, uh, you know, 21st century economic think. He was already conceiving of how Asia, North America, Western Europe could have these global trade routes. By the way, Governor Stevens, as Don knows, uh, had very similar ideas uh, later in the century for the Washington Territory. Uh, but the point is, uh, when he's coming out, it isn't just for a uh, uh, you know vacation. By the way, he traveled around the world with this in this first trip, 1825. He did it one other time in his life. Um, what I wish we had was an x-ray of that canoe, because guess what? Down by his feet is a keg of grain. He brought the first grain. There are no cereal grains, uh, apart from wild rice, uh, uh, you know, native to North America. So all this had to be brought in. <clears throat> and so he brought a keg of uh, English white llamas with him on the 1825 trip. And there he's coming down the Columbia River. And while it's a long trip all the way across the country, he, you know, set port at, uh, at Hudson's Bay and then came across the Canadian prairies, uh, came down virtually the entire length of the Columbia River to deliver this. And if you know your Northwest geography, of course, you got to enter the Northwest, uh, uh, not directly here in Puget Sound. You come down through the inland Northwest. Fort Vancouver was then underway, being established. The first post under his leadership, was, of course, was Fort Vancouver, the, what became the great emporium for the Pacific Northwest, and then uh, also directed the establishment of, of, of uh, Fort uh, Nisqually. Those were three of the great uh, centers of trade. Here you get a little picture of what was uh, uh, what was his vision. There was also uh, a fur trading post you may know down here, Fort Walla Walla, uh, originally called Fort Nez Perces, located at what is today Wallula, but uh, too dry really to grow much. Um, it was basically a horse trading king. Today is a place known as Hudson Bay Farm. 
and uh, it was one of the other very small network of grain producing areas by the late 1820s, early 1830s that was supplying the network of traders all across the Pacific Northwest. By the way, last year we supplied them with white llamas. They'll finally be growing this coming year uh, the grain that was originally uh, raised there a century ago. So that's kind of exciting to me. Yeah, this is just stunning to me. Some of you maybe have seen pictures like this before. I've seen a million photos of Fort Nisqually right here in our backyard. You know, it was just up the road here, right? Originally at uh, DuPont and then during World War II. I'm happy to share with you that the original building, many of the original, several of the original buildings were there, including the oldest building in the state of Washington this year. So, and so they were disassembled and they were uh, reassembled in uh, Tacoma at um, uh, Point Defiance uh, Park. I encourage you to go see there because when you go to many of these places in the United States and Canada, I have to tell you, they're, they're like Potemkin villages. They're, they're, they're kind of like fake. Uh, they've been rebuilt by very dedicated people, uh, and it's exciting to see them. But it's really neat to go and walk in the place that was really there at the time, where they served the kinds of wonderful uh, culinary treasures here that Kelly and his team have put together. So guess what? I had not seen this, which is now one of the most detailed images I had ever seen of Fort Nisqually until last Tuesday. No. <laughs> I have a guy who I teach with. Come, to, you know, you know. You, here's how these stories go. You've all heard these, right? Oh, hey, Dick. I've always heard you. Yeah, I know you're interested in the history. And guess what? We bought this house in Tacoma, and there was a whole box of books downstairs, and all the covers are off. And you know, so I'm going to throw them away unless you want. Okay. Well, one was Heinz's Illustrated History of the State of Washington. Not a particularly rare book. But, but, but a book I just, I simply never really seen uh, that. And here is one of the most detailed views, a beautiful lithograph of uh, Fort Nisqually. And the barn you'll see here shortly, and then we're going to break, is, uh, is there as well. This one I know <coughs> is not the easiest to see. It's a little fuzzy, but you know, we're glad we have it. Because, uh, as I told you, part of the joy in working with good folks like you on these projects is that uh, the story is happening before us. It's unfolding right now. Um, the first place where the farms were established here where we live in southern Puget Sound were within the orbit of the original Fort Nisqually. The largest one was called Spanaway Farm, S-P-A-N-E-U-H, for which Spanaway is named here, here by Tacoma. And uh, no record of it has ever been found visually. I found a map at the Hudson's Bay Archives in, uh, uh, I can't remember, Ottawa, Toronto, Toronto. Uh, but no visual image, okay? So last year, guess what? I'm on a flight somewhere. I don't know where I was even at, coming back and forth. But I know it was on Alaska Airlines. And in the ads in the back of the Alaska Airline uh, in-flight magazine, is an advertisement for an art gallery in La Conner. They're selling this painting. I don't know the price, but I do know, I told the good folks at uh, our historical society, get up there, and I hope they did. Because you know what, the, it's titled Mount Rainier from Spanaway Lake, 18, it was, it's about late 1870s, early 1880s, when there was nothing there except the Hudson's Bay Spanaway Farm, and this thing was quite small. And when I looked at it under a magnifying glass, it's the barn of the farm, and it's the wheat field where they're growing that grain. Uh, so it's exciting to be in this work where we're finding out new things, oldest building in the state, probably the Pacific Northwest, 1850, uh, is the barn. Uh, at uh, Fort Nisqually, where the very grain you're going to be tasting now, both Scott's Bear, the barley that was hulled and made into biscuits and scones, perhaps bannocks, and the, um, the uh, white llamas and Sonora uh, uh, were stolen. And this is my crew. These are my grandsons, Zachary and Micah, out there helping Grandpa last summer make this, uh, uh, get the crop in. 
and uh, we're using the tools that probably Dr. Tolmy uh, uh, knew about. As you can see, my uh, youngest one there, Micah, he thought he had a better way uh, <laughs> until he really started working with it. And guess what? Uh, old Grandpa's sigh worked uh, circles around him. When we come back after our flavoring test here, because you're now, thanks to Kelly, actually going to taste the real thing. I call this flavorful authenticity. This isn't just fake saying, oh yeah, it's kind of a grain like we had back then. No, these are the actual varieties, and you'll find they have very distinct flavor profiles. How enriching that we can establish and reestablish this as a part of our great heritage. So thanks so much for your attention, and we'll kind of dismiss back here. <laughs> Take about a 10-minute sample, thanks to Kelly. Kelly, we're going to say a word or two here, and and uh, we'll proceed. Okay, let's come back and see Kelly, and then we'll return. That I like to develop a, a bit more fully here. Uh, I had no idea about its family connection. Founding fathers and mothers of the Pacific Northwest. Really, I mean, uh, it's, it's it's remarkable. And so uh, uh, great to be with you. Uh, relating these great stories because uh, they're the story of America. You know, these are families from various ethnic backgrounds that I think are inspiring to talk about how they come together. The Bush families, black experience in the Midwest and, and, and the South. Owen Bush's father is this somewhat mysterious figure uh, who when we really look deeply into the story and connect the dots, there is very strong evidence that he was a black fur trader for the Rocky Mountain Fur Company, and so it wasn't by accident that his descendants decide to come out here to the Oregon country. It is very likely that along with just a handful of fur traders as early as the 1810s, 1820s, he was out working in the uh, Northern Rockies. And so that part, that, that's part of what may have motivated them to come. Um, Oregon at that time uh, excluded blacks from owning land. And so the family relocated north. And they came right here to where we are, to Tumwater. And there is, in fact, for all of you interested in the brewing world, boy, I could get myself in big trouble here, I suppose, but I'll give you the big secret. There's a hop still growing on the property. <laughs> and uh, and so uh, so it's exciting, you know, that we can find those things again that that give these unique flavor profiles uh, and real authenticity. Uh, Owen Bush, just a huge story. I, I'm sure Don's had entire programs devoted here, and so in my little ten minute uh, intercession, I can't go deeply, but I will tell you this: that this was a man of great vision. This was a regent for Washington State University, a scholar, an academician, but you know what he really loved doing? What you and I do, rolling up our sleeves and getting in the dirt. And so he was a farm farmer, and he experimented with dozens and dozens of varieties and uh, entered them in uh, uh, the World's Fairs that were held here in the United States in the 1880s, 1890s. 1893 is a pivotal year for the Chicago World's Fair. And, um, and uh, he received a gold medal for his grains. Washington Grains led the country even then in production. By the way, Whidbey Island, couldn't imagine that, had the highest yield of any uh, dry land uh, grain during that time. Um, the, um, you know, a, lo a lot of you I know have special interests in these culinary associations, and I'm violating every rule of PowerPoint expression here, I know, by having such a dense uh, text on this one, but bear with me for one, okay? <laughs> just, just to show you that uh, uh, those of you that are restaurateurs and, again, interested in these culinary connections that uh, are connecting in very practical ways with consumers, they, they're interested in health. They're interested in authenticity, not pretend stuff. And that's a whole other topic, right? We're not going to go there. There's a lot of pretend and even worse uh, contrived uh, ways of making you think something is good and nutritious when in fact it isn't. Uh, I hope you can edit these remarks, by the way, if they're being recorded. Uh, but, you know, that's out there. 
and uh, it, it's refreshing to go back to these period uh, recipes and uh, experts in cooking from the very periods we're talking about. There was a Hudson's Bay Company edition of the Dominion Cookbook. By the way, this thing was uh, issued in, in multiple uh, versions. I was fortunate to find one of the Hudson's Bay versions on, uh, on uh, big books and uh, was fascinated by the Northwest flavor of so many of the recipes. Um, the uh, grain-based, uh, uh, you know, pancakes, uh, fritters. By the way, as you know, we had a, a first family. President uh, Hayes and his wife came to the Northwest. By the way, on the steamship Harvest Queen, didn't you, wouldn't you like that, up the Columbia River. And, um, and so they had many grain-based uh, uh, and in all kinds of breads, biscuits, all that kind of stuff. Uh, and so just fascinating to see it. Uh, we're featuring, thanks to Kelly, uh, the Red Fife Grains, uh, which is a, a family of grains, uh, uh, really. Um, uh, Red Fife actually came to North America in the 1840s, and, and it, it, it's, it, it deserves a, a minute. I mean, if you could maybe, uh, if we're, we're going to put a golden crown on Turkey Red for reasons I'll explain to you shortly, but, but maybe the silver crown should go to Red Fife, um, because uh, until the middle of the 19th century, the fact of the matter is there were no bread grains raised on the continent. All the grains were soft white. So they made great biscuits, they made great pancakes, they made great bannocks, they made good, flat, good flatbreads. But if you wanted to make a loaf of bread, good luck. It will be a brick. Uh, and, and when you read about colonial families eating, eating bread, that, that's what they're eating. Um, uh, and so when you use those recipes and, and use uh, uh, you know, non-rising flour like a hard wet red grain, you're, you're going to get a very different product. In the 1840s, almost by accident, uh, Fife grain came. It sounds Scottish because of uh, 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 family, uh, David Fife, that introduced it up in Eastern Canada. Um, but this is actually a grain from that uh, uh, southeastern European, northern Ukraine. We've actually documented now the river system where in the headwaters. Um, that was uh, an indigenous land race, the original uh, version. By the way, there were thou tens of thousands of land races uh, uh, raised all over the country, uh, all over the world by 1900. Sadly, uh, many of them have been displaced and had it not been for the good work of the germplasm centers here and abroad, a lot of them would have been, many of them have been lost. But those of special historic significance to the Pacific Northwest, I am thrilled that we've been able to ferret out and, uh, and start uh, returning. Um, I have to say, though, that Red Fife didn't take off here in North America. We, we didn't have all the trading exchanges that we have today in the 1840s. It was largely limited to Eastern Canada. Some did come down. You can find reference periodically uh, as early as the 1860s to Red Fife, uh, you know, somebody growing it in North Dakota or something like that, but, but not, not widespread. The grain that will transform the American milling industry, uh, we'll talk about in, in our next, uh, next break. Oh, by the way, I didn't tell you, that's Mike McGuire there, the education officer at Fort Nisqually, raising Red Fife. We reintroduced it to the fort and uh, also grinding, and, uh, and uh, we had bread from it, and, and, and it's great. Pacific blue stem was introduced to the region at this time. Um, blue stem, of course, is a, is a, it's a beautiful grain, isn't it? it? It's a cousin of the llamas, but it came totally the opposite direction. It came via Australia, where farmers also uh, uh, established themselves in the middle 1800s. Uh, a flavor of full soft white, and uh, name, as you can tell, there's not a lot of blue there, except the frame I put around it. But, uh, but it does have blue streaks on the upper stem and uh, sometimes on the uh, kernel husks. Well, another discovery here is we're about wrapping up this uh, installment, uh, just to show you that you never quite know what you can still discover in our day and age. It's just so fascinating. This isn't in some dry, dusty old bin of books. Um, I was... Um, I was looking, I told you, I did find a, uh, 
uh, a map of Spanaway Farm, even though I had never uh, seen a picture of it, had never known any existed until that painting. Uh, but uh, the Hudson's Bay Company w was great with documenting things, and so there are many maps. <laughs> um, and so they they had a map of uh, of one of their largest grain farms called Plithlow Station. And uh, I, I just happened to take a look at this is just a couple of years ago, and uh, and we were living uh, down here uh, in the Tacoma area, and. I, I, I put it on a modern quadrangle map because they actually had about six farms and I wanted to see where they were all located. It's fun to go see if these things still exist or is now a pavement and you know apartment building. And, uh, and one of them, Plethlow, was apparently undisturbed. <laughs> Why? Because it's on the zillions of thousands of acres, uh, joint base, Lewis McCord to give us permission <clears throat> to get on and find this place, and we did. And when we crossed this big path of brush and corners and dirt trails and mess, look what we found. 32 trees, 32 fruit trees, uh, most of them still bearing. Uh, we found the locust stand where the original house had been for Tiflo Farm. I have a tough time saying that. I was going to say Tiflo. Uh, it's spelled both ways, but I really think it's based on uh, a Puget Sound Salish word, Tiflo. And, uh, and it's just fascinating. So I know this isn't about grain, but it's highly related to grain, isn't it? And when we come back for our next break, um, having sampled now these varieties I've talked about, thanks to Kelly, uh, we'll come to what may get the Beauty Award uh, for some of the more beautiful grains that were introduced beginning in the 1890s. And this leads then to this period of the great transformation of the American grain industry because of what was happening right here in the Puget Sound in greater Northwest. So, again, thanks for your great attention here, but feel free, let's go back and, uh, since its origin in the 1800s. There were people hired, latest, greatest discovery relating to this, the last slide I show, so, or uh, one of the last, so be sure you don't leave, if nothing else, if we're going to see this. Uh, it's quite a story. Uh, in any event, uh, Right after World War II, I think, because there was so, these collections had become so vast in Beltsville, Maryland for the USDA, a decision was made to break them up for security reasons and just management and send them around to different parts of the United States. So I, I think like fruits and vegetables maybe went to California and like nuts and things, I don't know, in the Midwest or whatever. I, I can't remember where it went, but I do know this. The small grains collection went to Aberdeen, Idaho. So it's arid in southern Idaho, but you have access to water with irrigation and uh, low disease because of uh, hard winters. And so these grains are grown out there. And uh, they will give you like a teaspoon full, so it does take a long time to grow them out. Um, but at least they're preserved. The, 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 the challenge, of course, is identifying the right one because they went by nicknames and, uh, you know, there's a lot of odd detective work you have to do. Um, a couple of you asked specifically about the oldest grain ever in the Northwest, the uh, white winter Hudson's Bay Llama Sweet. And somebody uh, in the Portland area in 1910 was still growing that grain. And a USD plant explorer went down through the Willamette Valley, a famous grain growing area, and uh, and, uh, and, and took a sample and sent that to the USDA and had that not happened, we, we would have lost, uh, we would have lost uh, Hudson's Bay White Llamas because nobody had saved it. It, it, was into, it was such a good grain, by the way. You can read port, reports all the way into the 1920s of people raising it, but that was the only case where somebody actually saved it for the future of mankind. And so, uh, you know, it's wonderful that was done. In the 1890s, of course, um, the Northwest had finally seen the completion of the great transcontinental rail lines. 
So in the 1880s, the North Pacific uh, was completed across the, uh, uh, the United States, and then connections with Great Northern and others, and suddenly all these great grain growing areas, east and west of the Cascades, were connected to markets nationally and internationally. This led to a proliferation then, even a greater emphasis on grain production because of new markets. Uh, Red Russian was a nickname <coughs> given actually to an English grain called Squarehead. Uh, it is a uh, soft red grain, very flavorful, good for brewing, uh, for hefeweizens and other, you know, there, there's a kind of bitterness in the tan of these uh, red grains uh, that make for an interesting flavor for uh, hefeweizen uh, brews. And uh, this was raised uh, throughout the Pacific Northwest and was the variety, I think I mentioned to you, uh, walked away uh, with the, in the 1890s with the largest uh, per acre production anywhere in the United States on Whidbey Island, believe it or not. It, I, I don't remember the exact number, it's in the book I have, Harvest Heritage. It's, I, I know it's over 100 bushels an acre. So, I mean, it's, it's incredible. Today, that's incredible, right? And uh, little over 100 years ago. Um, our good friends at uh, W. Schumann Vernon uh, grew out a small field there, you'll see in this uh, photograph. I, I just think it's a, it's a beautiful grain and uh, nice to see it once again being raised. Part, part of the mystery and the fun of detective work is how it gets these names. Uh, Don and I, our background, you can tell by our last name, is German, but, uh, but our people came from Russia. And they were Germans that lived out in the Volga region. Others lived in the Black Sea area. They came to the United States, were farmers. And so it, it, the grain was just called Russian because our people were raising it. It, it actually has nothing to do with Russian. <clears throat> These connections made to a vital resurgence of uh, economic development in the Pacific Northwest, unknown since the days of the Hudson's Bay uh, expansion across the region. Only now it was for the grain trade. <clears throat> and Tacoma uh, became the real hub for this, interestingly enough. Uh, the Northern Pacific Railroad uh, came clear across the uh, continent, but the Cascades led to challenges on where to route the uh, the train route, and, and you know, there's an interesting story back to Governor Stevens's day, who wanted it across Snoqualmie, and that didn't come to pass. Where he's got a big argument with George McClellan about this, and uh, and wound up coming down to Portland, and then and then then the the line came up here to where we are uh, in Tacoma. So Tacoma became the terminus, you see, of the Northern Transcontinental Line, and so grain could be shipped east to U.S. markets. Or, now also, Tacoma becoming a deep water port uh, before Seattle took prominence, became the major grain supplier for the, uh, I, beyond the Pacific Northwest, actually, the, uh, the entire uh, north part of the nation. At the same time, because of immigration to the region, this period of time we're talking about, I would guess if I asked for a show of hands, many of you might, some of you already have mentioned it, that your relatives came uh, here as immigrants. And you know, this period from 1890 to just when World War II, World War I breaks out in 1914, you know, we have this massive immigration from Southern Europe uh, and Eastern Europe, uh, other places too, but primarily there. And, uh, and so this is where people, uh, you know, come to our region from uh, that part of the world and they bring grain with them. And so beginning initially in the 1870s, <coughs> the Germans from South Russia uh, brought a Crimean wheat with them. They loved it for breads. And if you've ever mixed a 50-50 rye, uh, turkey red wheat flour mix, it just makes the most soft, flavorful uh, yeast bread that is imaginable. And our mother spoils with it to this day. But 94, she insists on making a sandwich every time I leave home. And, and it's great. <coughs> um, and I think you'll sample some of this here in a few minutes. The reason this was revolutionary uh, was, as I told you a few minutes ago, until the late 1800s, there were no 
what we would consider today bread grains raised in the United States. There were these small enclaves in eastern Canada, Fife, but it was virtually unknown here in the United States. These people initially settled in Kansas <clears throat> and Nebraska, and, uh, and the millers were not thrilled with this. If you've ever thrown a handful of hard red wheat in your mouth, good luck, it might break your teeth. I mean, it is hard, right? Well, it was not good on the machinery and it broke some of the machinery. And it led actually to the development of rolling mills. <coughs> and um, and what's the other, Rob, is Rob here with us yet? Hammer mills. Hammer mills, thanks, yeah. And, and so, so that continued, uh, or that really developed at that time. And these immigrants kept saying, yeah, but taste the stuff. Will you please taste the stuff? And uh, eventually they did, so that by the 1890s, Turkey Red got to be the dominant grain raised in the Midwest and then came west with these people who immigrated to this region also then in the 1880s and 1890s. Um, today, if you trace the pedigree of any bread grain, I, I will virtually say any bread grain, you'll find its great, great, great grandparent is Turkey Red. Um, the reason it isn't raised widely today, all these heritage grains, isn't because they're not incredibly flavorful, but uh, grain began being sold, you know, to the world markets in the late 18, early 1900s on volume. N nobody gave it a taste test. It's all about how many bushel per acre can you raise? And uh, so these were hybrid. We, Don and I raised turkey red, and I'm here to tell you, uh, you know, if you get a late rain, and uh, you know you're out there in the June, and uh, you know an inch drops out of the sky. Guess what? It's all going on the ground. It 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 it, it uh, has what we call a lodging issue. Okay.